and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menen who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Don't have time to read all about their adventures that unfold in the next two chapters. The first missionary journey covered about a three-year period. They went to the island of Cyprus, and then they went to western Turkey, where they made a loop and came back to Antioch, where they started out. But I want to read to you the very conclusion of the journey at the very end of Acts 14, if you'll flip over with me. The end of Acts 14, and looking down at verse 21, Acts 14 and 21, they preached the good news and they won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. Look at these words in Acts 14, verse 22. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here and your powerful word. I pray that you'd come breathe life. Speak to someone in this church today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Set your sails for the wind of God. Those words 22 years ago this month were something that the Lord used to help me to take the next step on an adventure, on a journey of faith. They were printed on the front of a brochure from the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. And when I saw them, they awakened a dream inside of me. They awakened courage and hope and faith inside of me. For the next 18 months, I carried that brochure around in the front cover of my Bible. I looked at it often. I prayed over it. I held it in my hands. I cried over it sometimes until it became a reality in my life. And my life has been an adventure ever since. Beloved, I have a word for someone here today. I believe that the Holy Spirit is here to extend an invitation. Chart your course. Cast off your mooring lines. Weigh anchor. Heave the halyard and set your sails for the wind of God. As a follower of Jesus, you have been called to a life of adventure. Listen, you're not called for a life of quiet comfort. You're not called for a life of convenience. You're not called for a life of pursuing self-interest and self-indulgence. You are called to a mission. You're called to be God's partner on the earth. You're called to be His voice. You're called to be His hands, His feet. You're called to manifest His presence in the world. You're called to be an administrator of His salvation. You are called to carry on the work begun by Jesus and proliferated by the apostles and the early church and perpetuated down through the ages by the saints. Now it's your turn to carry the baton. God is beckoning. Set your sails for the wind of God. Acts chapter 13 and 14 tell the story of Paul's first missionary journey. And why are these stories important to us? Why do they matter? It's because they tell us what we should expect in our journey with God. And as I look at Paul's experiences in Acts 13 and 14, I find three things that you can expect on your journey, and I want to share them with you this morning. Three things that you can expect on your journey. Set your sails for the wind of God. The first thing to expect is to be called. Expect to be called. How many of you would love to know 
what was the secret of Paul's success? What was the secret of his victorious Christian life? What was the secret of his boldness, of his effectiveness? What was the secret of his unrelenting perseverance? The secret was the hope that was in him because of God's call on his life. The call of God defined him. The call of God shaped him. He said, by God's grace, by the grace of his call, I've become what I've become. God's call guided him. God's call gave him hope. Years later, when he stood before King Agrippa II in Acts chapter 26, Paul told Agrippa that it was the call that had kept him going. It was the call that had fueled him. It was the call that had sustained him and preserved him. He told Agrippa, Jesus called me to be his servant and his witness. He sent me on a mission. I answered that call and Jesus has helped me to this very day. After that, Paul wrote from a Roman prison, I pray that God would enlighten your heart so that you would understand what is the hope of his calling. We have a little saying around harvest time. It goes like this. Your call is not your call. Your call is not your call. Beloved, listen to me, and may God give you grace. If you are born again, you are called. The moment you received Jesus into your heart, you also received his call. Lloyd John Ogilvie said, to be in Christ is to be in mission. Spurgeon said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Your call is not your call. It's not your call. Whether you're called, you are called. It's not your call to what you're called. It's his call on your life. Paul wrote, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus said, you didn't pick me. I picked you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you're called to a mission. And one of the most important goals of your Christian life is to connect with that mission. It's to pursue his call. It's to seek clarification of his call. It's to fulfill his call. You know, you might look at the life of Paul and you might think, well, you know, it was easy for Paul to connect with his call. When he got saved, God knocked him off his horse. A light shone down from heaven. He, he heard an audible voice. He saw a vision of Jesus. He was blind for three days, and then God sent a prophet right to where he was staying to heal him. If I had an experience like that, it would be easy for me to connect to my call. All I had was a little tugging in my heart. All I had was a, an unexpected wave of emotion that swept over me. All I had was somewhere deep inside a knowing that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. I haven't had a voice from heaven, so how am I supposed to connect with my call? But beloved, I want you to listen this morning. Even though Paul had a, a more dramatic salvation encounter than most of us, he still had to work to connect with his call. All Paul had was a promise from Jesus that God was going to use him. But Paul had no idea when or where or how that was all going to happen. You remember three years in the desert and ten years sowing tents? Paul started just like all of us in the dark about his call. He, he, he didn't really understand the full implications of God's call. You know why God does that? You know why he doesn't tell us everything at the very beginning? It's because if we had any idea what the road would hold ahead of us, we'd say, no, thank you, Lord. In fact, well into his apostolic career, Paul wrote, brothers, I don't count myself to have yet attained, but I am still stretching forward to take hold of that thing for which Christ took hold of me. 
But we read here in Acts 13, 1, in Antioch, Paul took a big step forward in connecting to his call. 13 years of preparation, three years in the desert, 10 years sewing tents, and now Paul was finally a co-pastor with Barnabas in Antioch. They went to deliver aid to the church in Jerusalem, and when they came back, Paul was about to take a big step forward in understanding his call. And as I, I look at the opening verses of Acts 13, I find something important about the atmosphere in which callings occur. There is an atmosphere in which calls occur. You know, Paul and Barnabas, they, they might have thought that the ministry in Antioch was it. They might have thought that, that they were living the dream, that, that they were uh, experiencing really the, the heyday and the fullness of what God had for them. Barnabas had already had a successful ministry in Jerusalem. Now he was on a second chapter in Antioch. He had been around for a while. He had already had a good run. He, he might have thought that was it. Paul was having the best year of his Christian life so far. He, he, God had promised him that he would evangelize Gentiles, and here he was in Antioch, Antioch evangelizing and pastoring Gentiles. But in Antioch, there was an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit could speak, and what he told them is, brothers, there's more than this. Beloved, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to someone in this house this morning and tell you there's more than this. This is not where your story ends. This is not how your story ends. Don't you dare put a period where God has put a comma. And don't you settle for anything less than a life that ends with a big exclamation mark. Set your sails for the wind of God. So what creates an atmosphere where calls happen? What creates an atmosphere for calls? One thing I find here in the opening of Acts 13 is uncommon unity. Uncommon unity. I remember vividly the day that the Holy Spirit spoke to me about our call here at Harvest Time to uncommon unity. Can I tell you that Harvest Time is absolutely unique in the town of Greenwich because of our diversity. There's not another church in our town that is as culturally and racially and socially and economically diverse as ours. You know, the history of our church property is that the United Nations was supposed to be built right here. They were going to call it Unoville. How dumb is that? It, it, it was going to be a model community to the world of peace and harmony. But can I tell you, God had another idea for this property. Because there's only one community in the world that can truly model peace and harmony. And that's the church of Jesus Christ. Where Jesus, who is our peace, has broken down the dividing walls of hostility that separate people. We had such a great time on Friday night at our church family dinner. Thank you to everyone who came. Thank you to everyone who, who brought great food. And I had so much fun meeting so many new friends here at Harvest Time. I met someone who just moved here from Louisiana. I met someone who just moved here from Zimbabwe. I met someone who just moved here from England. We have a group of 26 new Filipino believers from the Bronx. They have more friends in the Bronx who want to come, but they don't have any transportation. I think we need to do something about that in a hurry. I met several Catholic friends who've just started worshiping with us. I met someone who works in the Korean consulate in the United Nations. Some of our Brazilian friends were here, and we were all eating Italian <laughs> with sushi on the side. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, I, I spent the afternoon with a bunch of our Indian friends eating curry. So it was Italian and sushi on Friday night. It was curry yesterday afternoon, and today it's Zantac. Just like us, the, the church in Antioch was like the United Nations. The leaders that are listed here represent the diversity of that body. Jews and Gentiles, tent makers and royalty, Africans and Middle Easterners and Mediterraneans. In fact, the only thing that wasn't in the church at, the, at Antioch was Anglos. I'm just saying. 
Never before in the history of the world had such a diverse collection of people come together in a movement like this. And beloved, I want to tell you, that kind of uncommon unity creates an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit is at work. David said, look how beautiful, how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It releases the activity of the Holy Spirit. It releases the oil of his anointing. It releases the refreshing of the Lord. God commands a blessing there. Can I tell you the converse is also true. Where there is disunity, the Holy Spirit cannot work. When they came to the town of Perga on the first missionary journey, they did no ministry there. The reason is because there was disunity on the team. There was a conflict and John Mark eventually met that left them and they couldn't do any ministry until that issue was resolved. Beloved, unity is the work of the Holy Spirit in the church from which all of his other work springs. And when there is an uncommon unity the Holy Spirit speaks he guides he leads what creates an atmosphere for calls a second thing I find here is volunteer service volunteer service if you read the NIV Bible it says while they were worshiping the Holy Spirit spoke the King James translation is better it says while they were ministering the Holy Spirit spoke the word is volunteer service while they were volunteering and serving the Holy Spirit spoke beloved listen to me when you volunteer God guides volunteer service pleases him it's worship Volunteer service creates Christ-likeness inside of you through imitating Jesus who said, I am among you as one who serves. Volunteer service enlarges your heart for people. It acquaints you with the process of partnering with God. It gets you involved with what God cares about most on earth. You know, I'm glad you're sitting in your seat this morning. It would be awfully lonely preaching if you weren't there in your seat. But I have to tell you, may God, may you, may you have a little grace for me and forgive me. I have to tell you, if all you ever do is sit in that seat, you will never connect with God's call on your life. You'll sit there year after year wondering when God is ever going to speak to you about your call. If you want to connect with your call, get up and start volunteering. Go to the back door and start passing out bulletins. Grab an offering plate and start ushering. Learn the soundboard or the light board or the video camera or the graphics communion. It has a, a computer. It has a little devil in it this morning. Go lay hands on it and cast it out. Two weeks ago, I was with Joel Osteen, and I heard him tell the story, but it was so fun to hear him tell it in person. After 17 years in the video production closet, he stepped out behind his father's pulpit, and he became the most influential spiritual leader in our country. Do you know he's more influential than Billy Graham? He's more influential than Rick Warren, Bill Hybels, than Joyce, than Charles Stanley. He even rated higher than the Pope in a survey. And his journey began with behind-the-scenes volunteer service. If you want to connect with your call, get up and start volunteering. Go downstairs and change some diapers in the nursery. Teach a Sunday school class or be an assistant. My wife was teaching the kindergartners last week in this service. She had 19 kindergartners and no help in that class. We had to recruit a young grasshopper to come help her. Sign up for the community Easter egg hunt or to help out in vacation Bible school. I have a wonderful friend in Reading, Pennsylvania, Pastor Joe. He got started in children's ministry all because one summer when we were in Bible school together, I asked him if he would wear a clown suit for VBS. He said yes. He ended up marrying the girl who sewed the clown suit. They have three beautiful children. 
And Pastor Joe has four locations in the city of Reading where he has after school programs Monday through Friday where he ministers the love of God to hundreds and hundreds of at risk children. He has opened two shelters, he has opened a soup kitchen, he has opened two churches in the inner city. He gets up at three o'clock every morning to drive a bread truck so that he's finished his work to support his family by the middle of the morning and he can prepare to minister to his kids in the afternoon. When I get to heaven someday, my job is going to be to polish his crown. And it was all because he said yes to being a clown. If you want to connect with your call, get up and volunteer. Put on a yellow coat and go wave cars in the parking lot. Help out with the youth. Join the Good Friday Choir. I think there's still time. If you see Pastor Jason, lift things up and put them down. Do anything you can. If you see a need, fill it. Serve and see what God will say. What creates an atmosphere for calls? Another thing I find you're not going to like this one is fasting. Yeah, you thought changing diapers in the nursery was bad. You ought to go do that because if you don't, your next port of call is fasting. It says while they were ministering, while they were serving voluntarily and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke. The early Christians fasted two days every week. Jesus taught that life in the kingdom includes regular giving and praying and fasting. Fasting is an expression of desperation for God. And it's a means of petitioning the Holy Spirit for guidance. Fasting for guidance was a regular part of Paul's ministry. Before selecting new leaders for the congregation, he fasted. Before missionaries were sent out onto the field, they fasted. Paul lists frequent fasting as one of the rigors of his apostolic office. Beloved, listen to me. If you're stuck where you're at right now, if you know there has to be a change, if you know something has to give, something has to break, if you know you're called to ministry, but that's all you know, you don't know when or where or how it's going to happen, if you need more guidance from God, try a little fasting. And along with fasting goes prayer. Prayer is the most basic building block of the Christian life. It is the most fundamental and essential thing that we do as believers. In Genesis, the first people that were separated to God were known as those who call on the Lord. The early Christians, the first title for the early Christians were those who call on the name of Jesus. Prayer brings us into alignment with God's will. It brings our thoughts in alignment with his thoughts. It brings our will into submission to him. And prayer is a dialogue. It's not merely talking to God, it's talking with God. In prayer, we make our petitions. And in prayer, we also listen. In prayer, God guides our mission. What creates an atmosphere for calls? A final thing I find is listening. Listening. The Christians in Antioch, they believed that the Holy Spirit does speak. They anticipated he would speak. They valued what he said when he did speak, and they were committed to obeying him. In Antioch, there were teachers and prophets. Beloved, listen. Teachers tell us what God has said Prophets tell us what God is saying. And both are absolutely essential. What God is saying is always, 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 always. Did I say always? What God is saying is always measured against what God has said. But what God has said comes alive in our spirits by what God is saying. And if you want to discover God's call on your life, you must know what God has said and you must listen to what God is saying. Can I tell you something, beloved? You are in the right place here at harvest time to connect with your call. You're in the right atmosphere here to pursue your calling, to seek clarification of your calling, to take hold of that thing for which Christ took hold of you. Participate in the unity of the body. Volunteer to serve. Fast. Pray. Learn what God has said. Listen for what he's saying and anticipate that the Holy Spirit will call you. Set your sails for the wind of God. 
three things to expect for your journey. Second one is this. Expect to be called. And secondly, expect to be apostolic. Expect to be apostolic. Everybody look at me. One of the most important messages of the book of Acts is that apostolic ministry did not die with the 12 apostles. The 12 apostles had a unique place in salvation history. They bore a unique witness to Jesus, having been eyewitnesses to his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension. They have a unique place of honor in heaven, the Bible tells us. But beloved, listen, the ministry of the apostles was not exclusive to them. It didn't begin with them and it didn't end with them. I would never sell the 12 apostles short, but they would never want us to sell ourselves short either. They want us to know that their experiences are normative for every believer. They anticipated that we would experience the same things in our lives and ministry as they experienced. Luke goes out of his way to tell us that Paul was not one of the twelve, and yet he was an apostle. He's first called an apostle here during the first missionary journey. In the book of Acts, the ministry of Paul parallels the ministry of Peter. The ministry of Paul mirrors the ministry of Peter. And here's the message. Jesus rebuked demons and he healed the lame. Peter, one of the twelve, rebuked demons and healed the lame. And Paul, who was not one of the twelve, rebuked demons and healed the lame. Stephen and Philip and Ananias and Agabus and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila, they rebuked demons and they healed the lame. And God wants to use you and me to rebuke demons and heal the lame as well. And I don't mean metaphorically. Beloved, listen to me. This is a good preaching right here. I'm going to make myself happy in a minute. I'm going to start speaking in tongues. The book of Acts is written to show us what to expect. In fact, that would be a great title for this book, What to Expect. You ought to flip open your Bible to the very first page of the book of Acts and where it says the title, Acts of the Apostles. I want you to put in parentheses under there, What to Expect. Their experiences are our examples. These are patterns. Their stories show us what to anticipate. And watching how they handled it gives us principles for how we can handle the same encounters. You should expect to experience the same things that they did in the book of Acts. And if you're not experiencing them, then you haven't yet connected with God's call. So what should you expect? Got to go fast. Number one, expect power encounters. Expect power encounters. Jesus has called you to be a kingdom bringer. The great commission is your commission. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And as the Father has sent me, as he's authorized me, now I'm authorizing you. Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. I want you to notice it didn't say person, but to every created being because the gospel is an announcement of triumph, not just to people, but to demonic, but to demonic powers and principalities and territorial spirits. It's an announcement that Jesus has triumphed. And these signs shall accompany those who believe in my name. In my name they will cast out demons and lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You are called to be a kingdom bringer just as much as Peter and the other 12. Just as much as Paul and Barnabas. You're called to bring the authority of Jesus. You're called to bring the order of his reign where there's demonic chaos 
You're called to introduce the peace of God into situations where there's turmoil. You're called to bring wholeness where there's brokenness. You're called to bring liberty where there is bondage. And beloved, listen, as you bring the kingdom, just like Peter and Paul, you can expect confrontations with demons. You can expect the devil to resist you. You can anticipate conflict with human governments that are under demonic influence. In Paphos, the capital city of Cyprus, the provincial governor, Sergius Paulus, was under the demonic influence of a sorcerer named Elamis. Still today, in many places of the world, do you know that there are political leaders who make alliances with witch doctors and evil spirits and dark practitioners to keep them in their positions of power? Papa Doc and Baby Doc. They call him Papa Doc because he was a witch doctor. And Baby Doc, who ruled the island of Haiti, Idi Amin in Uganda. Odinga in Kenya, Pol Pot in Cambodia, Castro in Cuba, and maybe there are some first world nations where that's true as well. You know, Peter encountered the same thing in Samaria where the region was under the control of territorial spirits operating out of Simon the sorcerer. In Lystra, Paul encountered territorial spirits operating from the temple of Zeus outside of the city gate. Paul was stoned in Lystra, and they drank, dragged his body outside of the city gates dead. You can expect conflict with demonic spirits. You can expect power encounters. You can also expect apostolic suffering. Along the way, Paul experienced illness. Young John Mark couldn't take it anymore. He was freaked out by what happened with Elamis on Cyprus, and he deserted the team. You can, you can expect disappointments, desertions. They experienced human resistance and rejection. The Jews followed them from city to city, stirring up trouble. There was a riot in uh, Iconium. They were sent out of the city. They were ejected from Pisidian Antioch. No wonder at the end of the journey when Paul was encouraging the believers, he said to them, we must go through many hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. Beloved, you listen to me. Mission costs. It will cost you. If you connect with your call to be a kingdom bringer, you can expect conflicts and hardships, but here's something else to expect. In spite of those hardships, expect God to prevail. Amen. Beloved, look at me. Expect to win. Expect to win in time, every time. Did you catch the words of Jesus in Luke 10, 19? I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Beloved, here's what the devil never wants you to figure out. Here's what he wants you to never discover. Jesus hasn't just bestowed on you some authority. He has bestowed upon you all authority, all that you need to prevail against every work of the enemy. Simon's power was broken over Samaria. Elamis' power was broken over Cyprus. Paul lost a round in Lystra, but he went back and a church was established there and ultimately the gospel prevailed. You know, you can go there today. You will not find a temple of Zeus. It is buried under 10 feet of dust, but you will find a living church of Jesus Christ, you will prevail. What can you expect? One more thing I can't leave out. Expect to be, this is good right here. Mm, I'm going to make myself happy. Expect to be used right away. Expect to be used by God right away. Beloved, listen, may God give you grace. Apostolic authority and power belong to every believer as soon as they believe. If you're brand new to harvest time, if you're brand new to the Christian faith, if you haven't been walking with the Lord very long, don't assume this isn't for you. Or don't assume that it's not for right now. 
Don't assume that you have to go to Bible college first or you have to go to seminary. God, help us. I can testify if you go to seminary, it'll take a couple of years for the saints to pray the faith back into you that God actually wants to use you this way. Here's some news you can use this morning. The moment you receive Jesus and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are also filled with his authority and power. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would understand God's incomparably great power for you. His power is like the working of his mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Paul is saying that the same power that raised Jesus up out of the ground on the third day is inside of you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of you. Peter did the same works that Jesus did. Paul, even though he wasn't one of the twelve, did the same works that Peter did. And look here in the first missionary journey, brand new believers did the same works immediately that Paul did. In Lystra, Paul healed a man who had been crippled from birth. It is a parallel miracle to the healing of the man outside of the beautiful gate. Because of a local legend, the people of Lystra began to worship Paul and Barnabas as Zeus and Hermes. When Paul and Barnabas stopped them from worshiping, the people got angry. They figured if these guys weren't in fact gods, then they must be posers. And they turned on them and they stoned Paul and they killed him and dragged him outside of the city gate. But the brand new believers... The ones who had just accepted Jesus gathered around him and prayed and he came back to life again. Guess what? That's pretty good for some believers who haven't even been through the Alpha Course. But that's pretty good for some believers who haven't even been to Cleansing Stream yet. That's pretty good for some believers who, who haven't been out in the dome to the adult Sunday school class. They were brand new believers. They were raising the dead. And when Paul left them, he appointed leaders from those brand new uh, believers to carry the church forward. Did they still have some things to learn? Sure. Did they still have some growing to do? Sure. But what they understood was that the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ himself was inside of them. Set your sails for the wind of God. Expect to be called. Expect to be apostolic. And finally, a third expectation for your journey. Expect to be helped by the Holy Spirit. Pastor Jason, you can come and help me. Beloved, the first missionary journey is saturated with the Holy Spirit. It begins with, it proceeds with, and it finishes with the Holy Spirit. And Antioch... There was an atmosphere of uncommon unity. There was an atmosphere of volunteer service, of fasting and prayer and of listening. And the Holy Spirit spoke and he said, there's more than this. As they prayed into that word, the Holy Spirit pointed out the first port of call. It says, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. They set sail for Cyprus. And from there, they relied on the leading of the Holy Spirit every step of the way. When Paul was confronted by Elymas, it says he was filled in that moment with the Holy Spirit. And he knew what to do with that sorcerer. He knew how to take authority and to break that power. Listen, some of you need to go home today. And you need to listen. And you need to say, God, you show me the key for taking authority in my home. Show me the key for taking authority over my marriage, over my children, over my family, over my situation. When Paul was rejected by the Jews and expelled from Pisidian Antioch. It says he was filled with joy from the Holy Spirit. At that low moment of rejection, the Holy Spirit came and bolstered his spirit. Why is it in life that we can have a thousand victories and just one rejection can bring us all the way down? 
Why is it there can be so many things going well and we perseverate about the one thing that went wrong? I can have a thousand people in church on Sunday morning, but my heart grieves over the one that walked away and didn't come back. I've over 20 years in ministry, I've only ever had one person say no when I offered to pray for him. I've prayed for thousands of people. You know, I can't remember who I prayed for practically yesterday, but I will never forget that one man said no. Why is it that, that rejections, they, they steal a thousand victories away, but the Holy Spirit came in that moment of rejection and bolstered Paul and filled him with joy. When Paul came to a fork in the Roman road, the Holy Spirit led him down the southern path to Iconium. When Paul arrived in Lystra, the Holy Spirit gave him the ability that a man, a crippled man, was a miracle about to happen. Uh, the Holy Spirit all along the way gave them strategy and wisdom. And when it was time to go home, the Holy Spirit gave Paul the supernatural ability to see new leaders from among that congregation. Beloved, the whole journey, it began with, it proceeded with, and it concluded with the help of the Holy Spirit, and your journey will too. Expect the Holy Spirit to help you when you don't know what to do next. Expect Him to call and tell you, there's more than this. Expect Him to direct your footsteps to the next port of call when you're at a fork in the road in life. Expect Him to direct you down the right path. Along the way, He's going to point out individuals that are miracles waiting to happen. He'll point out individuals that are the key to releasing the kingdom where you are. The Holy Spirit, He'll tell you when to hold up. He'll tell you when to fold up. He'll tell you when to walk away and when to run. Expect the Holy Spirit to help you when the enemy comes against you. Expect the Holy Spirit to help you when people reject you. Expect the Holy Spirit to help you when it's time to head for home. The Holy Spirit will help you identify and empower the next generation who will carry the baton. Holy Spirit will tell you when it's time to come home, son. Come home, daughter. And he'll be with you every step of the way there. Beloved, look at me. The Holy Spirit is inviting someone today to embark on the greatest adventure of your life. And here's what you can expect. You can expect to be called. You can expect to be apostolic. And you can expect to be helped all the way home. Cast off the mooring lines. Weigh anchor. Heave the halyard. Set your sails for the wind of God. Would you stand on your feet? I'm going to give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, let's give him a great big praise. Oh, come on, let's give him a great big praise. Let's give him glory and honor and thanks in this place today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's run to his arms. Help us, Pastor Jason. But before we do, I have to ask this question today. You know, following Jesus is the greatest adventure of your life. Sin is boring. We know where it leads in the end. It leads to sorrow, heartbreak. It leads to destruction. It leads to the ruin of your marriage and your kids and your whole life. But walking with God is an amazing adventure. The Bible says, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has it even entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those that say yes and follow him on this great adventure. And where the adventure begins is on the Damascus Road. It begins with a moment of surrender to Jesus. It begins with an encounter where the light of God shines in your heart. And you know that Jesus is Lord. And you surrender and you give your life over to him. You say yes to him. You make him your Lord and the leader of your life. And I wonder just before we go this morning, we have to pray and go in just one moment. But I wonder before we do if there's someone here this morning. And today is your day to take the first step of the journey. 
Today is your day to receive Jesus, to surrender to him, to say, yes, God, I'll go with you on this journey. I'm going to follow you from this point forward. I wonder if there's someone here, you've never done that. You've never taken that first step of receiving Christ and making him your Lord. And today you want to do it. While heads are bowed all over this place. I want you to just lift your hand up high. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. There's one, there's two. Come on, is there someone else? I want to receive Jesus today. I want to invite him into my heart. There's three, there's four. Come on, is there somebody else? I want to receive Jesus today. There's someone right here. Uh, uh, someone else, that's five. I think I'm losing count. Is there someone else? I want to receive. I want to take the first step of the journey today and surrender to Jesus. Come on, lift up your hand high. Is there someone else? I want to receive. There's someone else. I think that's, is that six or seven? I don't know. I've lost count. There's eight. Thank you, Jesus. Is there someone else? I want to receive Jesus. I want to start. I want to take the first step of the journey today. Come on. If your heart's beating, the Holy Spirit, that's God speaking to you right now. Someone else, lift up your hand high. I want to receive Jesus. That's everyone, all of us. Would you lift up your hands all over this place? And I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want everyone to pray with us. And we're going to help some people take the first step of the greatest journey ever in life, the journey of following Jesus. Everyone repeat after me. And uh, we're going to be, if you're already a believer, we're just going to be like four friends just leading some people to Jesus today. Come on, let's pray together. You follow me. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus. Thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I'm surrendering. I'm saying yes to you. Let your light shine in my heart. I'm turning from my old life. And I'm turning to you. Wash my sins. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Jesus, I'm following you now as my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, before you walk out of the sanctuary today, would you just come to the front? Our pastors are going to be here. We have something we want to give you that's going to help you get started in your new walk with Jesus Christ. Everyone, real quick, lift up your hands all over. Lift up your hands all over. Listen, I want you to just ask the Lord to help you create an atmosphere where you can hear his call. Participate in the unity of the body. Serve, fast, pray, listen. Come on, I want you to just lift up your face to heaven. Father, right now I pray in Jesus' name that this week would be a week of hearing from you. God, some people are stuck. Some people, Lord, are at a fork in the road. Some people desperately need wisdom and direction right now. I pray this would be a week of hearing your call. Lord, there's some people who are called to ministry, and Lord, they don't know what to do next. Lord, I pray this would be a week of hearing. I pray this would be a week of dreams and visions. I pray this would be a week of you speaking by your living voice out of the pages of Scripture. Pray, God, that this would be a week of prophetic ministry and activity, Lord. I pray, God, this would be a week of guidance and direction in this place. Lord, I pray that you'd awaken expectation in our hearts to be apostolic, Lord, to experience on our journey what they experienced on theirs, Lord. Father, I pray with every situation from the enemy confronting us right now, Lord, I pray threatening us right now, I pray that you'd fill us with the Holy Spirit, God, and that you'd 
God, give us the key for taking authority over that situation. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your help this week. I thank you, Lord, that this whole week is going to be saturated with the Holy Spirit. Lord, it's going to begin with, it's going to proceed with, it's going to finish with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for walking every step of the way with us through the remainder of Sunday, through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, through Saturday. Lord, through the end of this week, I thank you, Lord, for good things coming in the name of Jesus. Come on, give him one more big praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless you, everyone. Uh, this will be our benediction. Hug about five people, and then uh, you may go. Uh, we'll see you Tuesday night for discipleship, Wednesday for family life night. Have a great week in God. Bless you. Bless you.